Thank you very much, guys. Hanging in there. Enjoying the sequence of guys with glasses talking about fundraising so far. Uh, sorry, I can't, I can't stop that, but I hope you find the next presentation interesting. Uh, my name is James Clark. I'm the head of tech and life sciences at London Stock Exchange. Uh, as the guys mentioned, I have a, a long history working with startups and working with venture. I don't have so much of a history working with investment banks, so I sort of bring a bit of a perspective of startups to what is a, a pretty unusual sort of thing for, for, stock, for stock exchanges and for public markets. One of the things that you find working with startups is that there's a huge uh, sort of preference for having data-driven decisions. You know, data is the thing that make, helps us to grow our companies. It, data is the thing that helps us to inform make a, the decision, decisions we make. However, when it comes to IPOs, data isn't something that most people make use of. It's a bit strange. Um, we tend to sort of focus on what other people say, what, what, the, what the market talks about, not really you know, looking at the underlying data. So I put this presenta presentation together to try and address that. I, um, I start with a quote. Um, this one here is a pretty famous quote about truth and lies. Uh, the really interesting thing is no one really knows who said it. It's been attributed to Mark Twain. It's also been attributed to Winston Churchill. It's a pretty good example of how truth and lies are actually something that we lie to ourselves about. And a lot of the myths that I'm going to talk about in this particular presentation are lies that we tell ourselves or things that we don't really know any better because nobody bothered to question them. In my case, it's about IPOs. Um, hopefully, you get something useful out of it. I've given you, I'm trying to give you case studies of companies that have actually disproven these myths. Um, and hopefully, that sort of leads you to question some of those things. And please. Give me lots of questions at the end because I like to answer questions where I can. So myth number one, I'm not a unicorn, so why IPO? Uh, this one's pretty common. It's probably the most common one that I've, I have when I talk to startups. Um, there's this prevalence that you need to be a unicorn. And I guess part of that is the coverage around tech is mostly about you know, what unicorns have IPO'd and how they perform. Um, but these guys weren't a unicorn. They were you know, $60, $70 million valuation at IPO. Um, as you can see from that growth rate, they're not that value anymore. They're somewhere closer to about seven or 800 million, right? And that's since March last year. Right? This is a public company growing at a Bitcoin-like growth rate, but with all the data you could possibly want to understand how to read a public company. So consider that next time you worry that you're not going to get alpha in a public market. We do also have some unicorns. So Alpha Financial was a unicorn at IPO. It was about a billion dollar valuation. Uh, but in this case, 90% of the equity was owned by the chairman and 10% was owned by the CEO. Absolutely no outside funding. IPO did a billion dollar valuation, jumped 30% on opening day, and they're now a little bit higher than they were when they IPO'd back in June. Myth number two, I need to have 100 million of ARR to IPO. Now, this one is really common when it comes to SaaS-based businesses. We tell ourselves that this is a really important number because if we don't have this revenue run rate, we're not going to be able to IPO. Now, the thing to bear in mind about this number is it's dictated by the fact that you would want to list on something like the NASDAQ. But if you're listing on NASDAQ First North or London Stock Exchange, or you're listing in another market almost anywhere in the world, you don't need this kind of a number. So Cerulean, the market cap at IPO is only 32 million. Their run rate was about five to 10 million. And they've obviously, as you can see, had a pretty successful experience since IPO. I should note, by the way, most of the companies that I'm featuring here have IPO'd in the last two years. So they're very recent businesses. This isn't you know, a historical thing. This is actually what the market is doing right now. Eve Sleep uh, you know, competes with companies like Casper. It's one of the sort of online mattress selling companies. These guys have grown. They're at about sort of 10 million, 15 million of annual revenues at the point they IPO'd with a fantastic valuation, as you can see. Haven't had the best of it since they've come to market, but at the same time, they had a really successful IPO and their annual revenues were in nothing like 100 million. The market is quite happy to accept companies that are growing and can actually project a forecast of growth into the future. This one should, uh, should be quite interesting anywhere outside the US. I need to IPO in the US to get the best valuation. Uh, this is where data is really important. I, I'm very lucky to work with a team of data people who some of them are sitting over here at the moment. They're the ones who did all the hard work with the Atomico research. I just go to lunch with people. They do the hard work. Um, but look, you don't need to IPO in the, U in the US to get the best valuation. This is something that has become a received wisdom. If you look at the data, it's not the location of listing that matters, it's the quality of the company. So if I look at a company like Loopup, San Francisco, London offices, they IPO'd in August last year. 
again, reasonably small cap, but they've almost doubled their value in you know, the, just over a year since their IPO, and they've had a really good valuation as a, pro, as a consequence. If you want something a little bit bigger, then you have WorldPay. Now, WorldPay IPO'd within a day of their most direct competitor, First Data from the US. WorldPay has been consistently valued higher than First Data has since they IPO'd in 2015. Now, they were bought off the market uh, earlier this year, but they're going to come back to the market as WorldPay. Very, very strongly valued. Again, the quality of the company is what matters, not the location of the listing. I can't access US investors from London. Well, you can access US investors from pretty much anywhere. In London's case, about 30% of all investment into the market comes from North America. You can perfectly well access US investment from London. Boca is another example. They IPO'd two weeks ago. Uh, San Francisco company, they took investment from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, NEA, Kozla Ventures, Index. Uh, they IPO'd a couple of weeks ago. Market cap was a little bit more than this, actually. Uh, it was about 150 or so. They raised about 60 million, and they've grown really nicely, even at 40% since IPO'd a couple of weeks ago. Another example, Purple Bricks. These guys actually started off in our growth market, and they've moved to our main market because they've grown so successfully. You can see the market cap at IPO, they're over a billion dollars now. So this is something that was actually highlighted in Atomico's research of you know, homegrown or European-grown uh, unicorns. They did this on a public market. No one has heard of me, so who'd invest? Um, a lot of people think you need to be a snap or you need to be you know, a really big household name to IPO. But that's not the case. Investors will seek you out. If your data is interesting, if your performance is good, investors will look you up and they will invest. I mean, Eternity Networks, interestingly enough, are a bit of a household name in Israel where they're from. They came to London to list it where they're not a household name because they could access investors who understood what they were doing and would actually be able to uh, would, would sort of invest in their business and do well out of it. Free agent is another one. Not a household name, but actually the process of IPO has given them a much bigger awareness of their customer base, and that they use that being a public company aspect to help them grow their business. I can't IPO because I need to raise more in the future. This is a weird one. I don't know why this has become prevalent. Um, part of it is, is because there's an attitude in the US of public companies coming back to the market to raise more money. There must be something wrong with the business. It doesn't really work like that in Europe. Uh, it certainly doesn't work like that in the UK. Uh, Just Eat, uh, we all know who Just Eat are. Um, their IPO, or since IPO, they've, almost, well, they've more than doubled their price. They've come back to the market seven times since they IPO'd. Every time at an increasing valuation, they've made use of the market. The market cap of their most recent follow-on was $7 billion. I'll have to do quarterly reporting. The bane of every tech company. Everyone who, every, every tech company I've ever heard of, everyone who, you know, Eric Ries is trying to create an entirely new stock exchange to avoid doing quarterly reporting. All I say is, my friend, come to Europe. EU regulations mean none of us have to do quarterly reporting. UK, like most of the rest of Europe, is half yearly reporting. Uh, half yearly report to investors in six months, and then an audited report at the end of the year. So Sophos, really interesting company, cybersecurity company, IPO'd in 2015. Um, market cap of 1.5 billion, deliberately chose to list in London because they would be have a much sort of greater, a higher position on the list of companies than they would in the US. They brought all their investors over. They roadshowed out of the US and brought those investors over too. It helped to push up their valuation. They've also done, they also made that decision because they don't have to do quarterly reporting. There's no Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, director's insurance is the third the price because you know, Europe is less litigious. There's all these reasons why companies use regulatory structure to help them with their IPO. Another example of an Israeli company, I've bought in Israeli companies is actually, because it's important, there's 30 or so Israeli companies listed in London. Increasingly, I go to Israel because lots of Israeli companies are looking for a quality capital market to grow on. And historically, they've always just gone to NASDAQ because that's what everyone always does. Everyone always does. So what we wanted to do is to try and challenge that perception. And working with their investors, we helped them understand what the data story said. You know, the data story says, you know, all the things we've just talked about, XL Media came to the market, they've IPO'd very successfully, they've grown very well since, the, since they've come, and it's just another example of how companies who, who break the mold, who do something a little bit different, who challenge the myths of what IPOs are all about, can be very successful in a public market, they can grow very well, you know, life doesn't stop when you exit, it's not even an exit, in fact, for most founders it's actually the start of the next phase of their business. 
but you can do this very successfully in London. And we like to work with companies who do that. And companies who can, who can do well, um, hopefully come and join us and they come and do this. Uh, this is me, but I won't leave it on that. Um, I tend to tweet a lot. If you want to find out with me, you can catch up with me there. Uh, but now I'd like to take your questions. Please have lots of them. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. Um, let's we had go a question. straight over to the questions. You yep. will see them in front of you. And uh, if there are no questions anymore on the Slido, we will still be able to raise your hand just in school and ask your questions. OK. How does evaluation get calculated IPO? Um, how long is a piece of string? Uh, evaluation is calculated on many metrics. Uh, a lot of the businesses we see, um, they tend to be very revenue generative. So as we talked about, having revenues is important. But more, and more than anything, having consistency of revenues is important. The consistency of revenues is what allows public market investors to track forward to see what your business is going to do in the future. So uh, you're probably better off growing at a consistent 30, 40, 50% a year, rather than doing it a very peaky 20, 30, 40% one month and then dropping the next. So valuation is calculated on a lot of things. Um, I'm going to kind of skip that question and suggest that you speak to your advisors because they're the ones who are going to help understand your value better. Um, how many expensive advisors and reports do I need to IPO? How do I get value from this process? Uh, so I have to say, raising private capital is going to be cheaper than raising public capital. It just is that way. Uh, the process of going IPO is necessarily a, a stringent one because you're going from having a group of investors who hedge their risk by being experts in your sector or experts in uh, finance or other, having other expertise to having um, you know, uh, investors who might not necessarily understand what you do. I mean, you want to be able to put out enough information so that you know, any of our parents can pick up our reports and be able to make an informed investment decision. The advisory process depends on the market. It tends to be a, an awful lot cheaper to do it in Europe, um, but you know, it depends on the sort of company. But if it's an aim-listed company in London, anywhere between, say, 200,000 and 500,000 pounds to IPO. But once you're on the market, it becomes the cheapest way to raise capital thereafter. How will Brexit affect the IPOs in London Stock Exchange? Uh, we get this one a lot. Um, all I can say is Brexit was, what, June last year. Um, we've had our best year ever. Uh, we hit our, uh, had a record month in July. I'm not really sure what the story is behind that. But all we can say is that um, if you have US dollar denominated revenues coming into a pound listed company, that's not necessarily a bad thing right now. London tends to be fairly, well, it tends to be, well, it is the most international capital market. We have, in terms of absolute numbers and in terms of percentage of companies listed on our market, we are the most international. In terms of sources of investors, we are the most international. So actually, being an international market in this case, a lot of companies haven't necessarily been that affected by Brexit. In fact, many companies are investing because they see an opportunity in the future. So from our perspective, it hasn't really had that much of an effect. Um, there are some aspects of our industry that will be affected, but from the, from the public market section, it hasn't really had that much of an effect. When should I start thinking about IPO strategies? At funding stage already? Look, I speak to companies from about seed stage onwards. I'd speak to them before, but frankly, there's one of me and thousands of you. Um, but what I find is the earlier you start thinking about this, the earlier you actually have an option. Now, I don't tell people to list. I give them information. I encourage them to research for themselves. I want them to make an informed decision about some of the most important aspects of their business. Because one of the challenges and one of the tragedies is where uh, management teams and entrepreneurs are being dictated to by board members who might be no less informed than them, but they're just acting on what they think they should do. And for investors, I would encourage you to look at the data and to understand whether the, op the, the opportunity is for your businesses, because you need to be informed as well. So for founders, the sooner the better. Um, be informed, have an understanding of what the process is that you need to apply when you need to apply it, so that when the time comes and you do have to make a decision, 
it's not a rushed one, you're not doing it in panic, you have the time to make the right sort of decision. What do I need to consider when it comes to share division? Um, I'm assuming this is something to do with market caps, and, or cap tables, sorry. Um, the point of understanding an IPO is that at IPO, uh, you effectively become a new company. All the existing shareholders' uh, positions are collapsed, and they, are, they issued shares in the new company proportionate to what their previous shareholding was, you know, accounting for dilution for going into the market. So the share division at, at IPO is going to be more or less similar depending on how, how, much of, how much of fundraise you're trying to do at IPO. When, I, well, when you consider investing in a company, what are the key things that you look at? I, I can't invest in companies. One of the challenges of being on a stock exchange is it makes uh, investing into public companies a bit of a challenge. So um, I don't. Uh, but at the same time, it's like any other sort of thing. You look at, if I was to put myself in the position of a public investor, uh, you want consistency. The thing to bear in mind about working with private investors, especially VCs, is they're going to only think about the upside. They'll invest in you thinking, if things, if things go great, that's going to be fantastic for me. I'll take as much upside as possible. The difference with a public market investor is a public market investor wants consistency of return. Within a portfolio of, of, of stocks that they've invested in, they're expecting different levels of return based on what you've told them you can deliver. If you massively over-deliver on what you're expecting to do, it actually creates an imbalance and they might need to sell out of some of your shares to be able to keep the balance within their portfolio. So just bear that in mind, consistency of delivery is important. So you know, the most important thing you can do is to deliver on the promises or deliver on your expectations of return uh, because that's actually what the public market investors are going to look at the most. Um, can you tell us an example of when an IPO went really wrong and what could we learn about it? Um, IPOs don't tend to go really wrong. Um, they can go wrong, but what you see more often than not is uh, you'll see IPOs being pulled before they go to market. In those sorts of situations, the advisory team has realized the market isn't there the way they hoped it would be. They'll probably pull the IPO so that they can come back to the market later or, or, or assess what their options are. Um, if I was to look at a, a case of an IPO where they really wrong, I'd look at somebody like, I don't know, Blue Apron. Um, you know, this is a company that really just tripped over the line to get to IPO. But one of the challenges of the model that they had applied was it's very hard to get the unit metrics to work and to scale at the, at the rate that they had and then to do that with public investors because public investors expect the returns to be delivered and if you don't deliver on those returns, you get punished. And one of the challenges of being a listed company, especially in the US, is you have quarterly reporting. You, know, you have to deliver on what you said you were going to do every quarter and typically the, sort of the, the, the rule of thumb is a company has about two reporting seasons or two reporting sessions to, to start hitting their numbers. And Blue, uh, sorry, um, Blue Apron have not really hit theirs anyway through. And they've, as you've seen, their, their valuation has dropped about 70% since they've gone to IPO. So um, there are examples of IPOs that go wrong, but more often than not, if your advisors are pretty good, they'll advise you to pull the IPO before it happens. Um, what do I need to formalize before listing? Do I need grown-up auditors? Yes, you do need grown-up auditors. Um, there are different listing rules depending on which markets you go to. Um, London's main market applies the same EU guidelines as the rest of European markets. You know, you need to have audited financial reports, usually going back about three years. Um, the marketing aim is slightly different. Uh, you do want to seek audited reports, but you can get dispensations. We had a company last year, they IPO'd after being only in existence for 10 months. Uh, but they had a very strong board, they had a very strong team. They had investment backers before they came to market, so they're able to get a dispensation from us as the exchange to be able to IPO. But generally speaking, yes, get auditors now. Start, look, start thinking about those things now. Um, what are the direct versus direct listing versus IPO? So direct listing, I'm assuming um, in, in the UK we call this an introduction. It's the thing that people are talking about that Spotify is looking to do. Um, what you really want to be well, what a direct listing is is when you go to when you list the company, but you don't raise funds. You just put the company on the market and hope that it starts trading, and you have a certain amount of shares that are available to trade. Now, one of the benefits of an IPO is, frankly, it's a fantastic piece of free, free publicity. So the reason why there's a lot of question about what Spotify is trying to do is because they're foregoing a huge amount of free publicity, although you could argue the fact that so many people are talking about their unusual uh, method of going public, they're getting all the free publicity they would have wanted. But generally speaking, you IPO because you want to raise funds. A direct listing is when you go to market without raising funds. It it's sort of swings and roundabouts. Companies do it. We've had a number of companies do it in London. It's actually pretty common. It's just not very common in tech. 
Uh, and I have about five seconds left, and I have no more questions, so thank you very much. All right, brilliant timing. Thanks so much, James. That was absolutely interesting.